when it comes to diarrhea, the first thing that you need to really identify is whether this is an acute diarrhea or whether this is a chronic diarrhea. Acute, we typically define as less than two weeks, whereas chronic is going to be defined by greater than four weeks. And then there's this in-between period of two to four weeks, which is kind of a gray zone where it could really be either an acute or chronic type of uh, diarrhea. For uh, acute diarrhea, what I really wanna do is split it up into two major groups. And that's gonna be who not to test and who to test. So the vast majority of patients are going to be falling into this group on the left, and that's because most of these infections are these self-limited viral illnesses that will just resolve on their own with symptomatic treatment. So therefore, there's no reason to do additional testing. They actually did some studies where they collected stool cultures on uh, patients, and they found that 95% of them were negative, which suggested a viral etiology of their illness. For example, the common ones we hear about a lot, norovirus, rotavirus, and then even more recently, COVID, those are also very common viral causes of diarrhea. You may also see what we colloquially call food poisoning. And what this is referring to is that preformed bacterial toxins from a food that's been left out too long. For example, Staph aureus uh, is a classic one and Bacillus cereus with reheated rice. So those are very common ones. And typically, these ones will show symptoms within six hours of uh, the consuming of the suspected food. If you see symptoms within six to 18 hours, the organism may be Clostridium perfringens. And then at greater than 18 hours, you're again looking back at that viral picture, where, which is likely the cause of their diarrhea. In terms of treatment, there have been some studies showing that PO is preferred over IV hydration. And for anti-motility agents, we have Imodium or Loperamide, which we give as a four milligram dose upfront and then two milligram dose per every loose stool thereafter for a max of 16 milligrams per day. So again, I just wanna reiterate that most people are gonna be falling into this uh, category on the left where no additional testing or treatment is really indicated besides just symptom control. As far as the people that we do need to test, however, uh, there is quite a few criteria that we have to be on the lookout for. So number one would be any recent hospitalization or antibiotics in the last three months. Anybody with very severe illness should be tested, and this is defined by severe hypovolemia, greater than six bowel movements per day, or severe abdominal pain. Any signs that are concerning for inflammatory diarrhea, which is defined by any temperature greater than 101.3, bloody or mucoid stools, high risk host features, for example, uh, age greater than 70, significant medical comorbidities such as heart failure or pulmonary hypertension, which may be exacerbated by significant uh, dehydration or fluid resuscitation efforts, known inflammatory bowel disease, pregnancy or immunocompromised state, any symptoms lasting greater than one week, or if there are public health concerns, for example, if there's a recent outbreak of Giardia or recent outbreak of EHEC, for example. So for any patients that actually meet these criteria, further testing and evaluation would be indicated. And so the first thing that we would check would be for a C. diff toxin assay, uh, depending on if they've had the recent hospitalization or antibiotics in the last three months. And then getting a stool culture is also indicated. Stool O&P comes up a lot, but it's generally considered a low yield test. However, it is indicated if symptoms have been growing on for greater than one week, if there is a known outbreak, or if the patient has HIV with a CD4 count of less than 200. The reason we get these tests is obviously because these patients are at higher risk. It's more likely that uh, there is gonna be an identified organism that we could potentially treat. There was actually a study that looked into patients who had diarrhea with severe illness. And in contrast with the uh, typical diarrhea where 95% of the cases were viral and had negative stool cultures, um, the rate of a positive stool culture if severe illness was present was significantly higher. And so that's why we get that stool culture. And so in terms of treatment, there is actually a recommendation for empiric antibiotics. 
And this is actually something I learned recently because uh, a lot of times I was a little hesitant to give antibiotics until I knew, you know, C. diff was ruled out or um, s tech or e heck were ruled out, you know, those ones that had risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome. But it actually is indicated if the patient is a high risk host, if they have severe illness, or if they have those signs for inflammatory diarrhea. The recommended antibiotics, at least in the outpatient setting, would be azithromycin or a fluoroquinolone. And uh, azithromycin specifically is preferred in East Asia, where rates of fluoroquinolone resistance are especially high. So keep that in mind if you are prescribing prophylactic antibiotics um, to somebody traveling to East Asia, for example. Again, I was actually surprised by the recommendation for antibiotics if there is signs of inflammatory diarrhea, which is when the stool is bloody or if they have a significant fever, because there's that theoretical risk of Shigella infection or um, O157H7 E. coli, both of which have a risk of developing hemolytic uremic syndrome if you give antibiotics. However, they said that if there is bloody diarrhea and fever, they actually do favor using antibiotics and that the, risk, the benefits outweigh the risks unless there is a known outbreak of Shigella or EHEC. So basically, as long as there's no known outbreak of Shigella or EHEC. And then finally, in terms of Imodium, in this case, we do want to be a little bit more cautious. So uh, as long as it is no fever or just a low-grade fever, and uh, if there's no bloody diarrhea. Again, because we do not want a slow colonic motility in the setting of an inflammatory diarrhea or a C. diff diarrhea, because that's just going to keep all the toxins inside. So we have to be very cautious about using Imodium in these situations until we've ruled out C. diff and ruled out some of those inflammatory diarrheas. All right, so that's the approach to acute diarrhea, where the main decision point is in figuring out who needs to be tested versus who does not require any testing. Now let's move on to chronic diarrhea, where the framework is completely different and we actually characterize the quality of the stool in order to initiate our workup. So for chronic diarrhea, there's kind of five main subtypes of diarrhea. So number one is gonna be functional diarrhea. Number two is going to be osmotic diarrhea. Number three is inflammatory. Number four is secretory. And number five is malabsorptive. And in terms of prevalence, functional diarrhea is actually the number one cause of chronic diarrhea followed by osmotic diarrhea and inflammatory diarrhea. So for functional diarrhea, the primary diagnosis that we're gonna be looking at here is IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. And remember that the way we diagnose irritable bowel syndrome is with the Rome criteria. And that's going to be described as abdominal pain at least once a week. And then two out of the three following criteria, so pain relieved with defecation, change in stool frequency, or change in stool consistency. In terms of treatment for IBS, uh, specifically the diarrhea subtype, uh, we counsel patients on a low FODMAP diet. We can use some antispasmodics for the uh, abdominal pain, so hyoscyamine or dicyclamine. There is actually some evidence for the use of bile acid sequestrants and rifaximin. And what seems to have the best evidence, uh, pharmacologically at least, are TCAs. Moving on to osmotic diarrhea, some common causes include lactose intolerance, excess consumption of sugar alcohols. So for example, those uh, artificially sweetened gum or uh, cough drops, if you eat too many of those, it can cause an osmotic diarrhea. In general, diet uh, can lead to osmotic diarrhea. And finally, laxatives are another common cause of osmotic diarrhea. And so with osmotic diarrhea, some of the things that we're looking for to characterize osmotic diarrhea is that it's characterized by a stool osmolar gap of greater than 125. So this is basically telling you that there is excess solute in your GI lumen, and that is what is pulling in water from your gut wall and leading to diarrhea. So you want to calculate the stool osmolar gap by getting a stool sodium and a stool potassium, which we'll talk about later. And osmotic diarrhea is relieved by fasting. And this is important because it differentiates it from secretory diarrhea, which is not relieved by fasting. In terms of treatment here, uh, we often ask patients to keep a diet journal 
to try and see what are some triggers for their osmotic diarrhea. If you're really unable to convincingly diagnose the lactose intolerance, then you can get a lactose hydrogen breath test. And then otherwise, you just want to avoid any possible triggers and treat symptomatically. Causes of inflammatory diarrhea are going to include IBD, so Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, history of radiation therapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors for uh, cancer therapies, are becoming more and more common. And so we're seeing more immune checkpoint inhibitor colitis, which is a cause of inflammatory diarrhea. And then finally, of course, chronic infections can cause inflammatory diarrhea. So CMV, TB, AIDS, MAC, and parasitic infections. So just like in the acute diarrhea section, you know, these uh, inflammatory diarrheas are gonna be characterized by bloody or mucoid uh, stools oftentimes. Uh, may be characterized by abdominal pain, and also you typically will see more systemic symptoms, especially with IBD. Think about all the arthralgias and skin manifestations, eye manifestations that you get, and then infections, you get, you know, persistent fevers and things like that. And obviously the treatment is treating the underlying cause. So if it's IBD, then we're going to do some immunosuppression, usually with those five ASA treatments, and then some biologics and immunotherapy, uh, immune modulating agents. Uh, for immune checkpoint inhibitors, we're going to give them high dose steroids. And then infections, you're going to treat the infection that's causing the diarrhea. In the secretory diarrhea category, we have multiple different conditions. Uh, one of the ones that the board exams like to test on a lot and is common in kind of middle aged older women is microscopic colitis. And this uh, has some pretty uh, clear triggers or you know, strongly associated triggers being NSAIDs, PPIs, and SSRIs. And then in terms of uh, other causes of secretory diarrhea, just meds in general. So metformin is obviously well known to cause diarrhea and NSAIDs just alone can also cause diarrhea and multiple other medications can cause diarrhea. Hyperthyroidism is a potential secretory etiology. And then we also have some more zebra causes of secretory diarrhea, which include the neuroendocrine tumors. So for example, a VIPoma, gastrinoma, and carcinoid syndrome. So for secretory diarrhea, you're going to see a stool osmolar gap of less than 50 which is going to differentiate it from osmotic diarrhea. And also it is not going to be relieved by fasting. And frequently patients are going to be having nocturnal symptoms going on as well. Whereas with osmotic diarrhea, you don't really see nocturnal diarrhea. And again, treatment is directed at the underlying cause. And then finally for malabsorptive diarrhea, you have celiac disease, tropical sprue, pancreatic insufficiency, which may be due to uh, chronic pancreatitis or from cystic fibrosis. You also have giardiasis. You have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, something called protein losing enteropathy, which is uh, associated with you know, diffuse edema and elevated alpha-1 antitrypsin in the GI tract. You'll see increased alpha-1 antitrypsin and volume overload. And you may also have some drug-induced enteropathies, the most famous or well-known uh, of which is Olmosartan. So that can kind of cause a refractory um, kind of celiac disease picture. So that's why we don't use this medication very much. Of course, with malabsorptive diarrhea, we tend to see greasy, fatty stools, and uh, we call it steatorrhea. And same as before, we're gonna have to treat the underlying cause. And sorry, I forgot to add this earlier, but bile acid malabsorption is also another cause. And this could occur if you've had a history of a cholecystectomy or if you've had an ileal resection. So you already see some clear differences in the way that we work up acute versus chronic diarrhea. And in terms of actual lab workup that we're gonna do for chronic diarrhea, there's, quite, there's basically a panel that you're just gonna order right off the start. So right away, some good tests to check would be a stool sodium and potassium. That's gonna help you calculate that stool osmolar gap to see if you're looking more at an osmotic picture or a secretary picture. You also want to check a celiac panel to rule out celiac disease and you want to get a TSH to rule out hyperthyroidism. We also want to get a fecal calprotectin, or depending on your institution, you may be uh, ordering lactoferrin, and that's going to be assessing for our risk of 
inflammatory bowel disease. Generally, we check a CRP, and the utility of a CRP is a little bit limited, but it does still provide some help in looking for inflammatory causes of diarrhea. Another test that we may check is a fecal elastase study. And what this does is it checks for pancreatic insufficiency. So if it's low, that can be sufficient uh, or suggestive of pancreatic insufficiency. Whereas if it's high, it's going to rule out pancreatic insufficiency. And then if indicated, then we should also get, uh, you know, the stool cultures, stool ONP, and that's going to go kind of based off your clinical suspicion and the patient's history. If they're having very significant abdominal pain, then a CT abdomen and pelvis is recommended. And if they have any red flag symptoms, such as onset after age 50, concern for inflammatory bowel disease, or just severe progressive symptoms, uh, you also want to consider GI referral for endoscopy. So this should be your kind of first pass workup. And then if all of that is negative or unrevealing, then there are some additional tests that are recommended, mainly checking for signs of malabsorption. And then if you haven't gotten the endoscopy or these stool cultures and things like that in your first pass, then you can get it in the second pass. And so mainly we're going to be looking at things like 25 hydroxy vitamin D, folate, B12, and iron studies, as well as calcium, magnesium, albumin, and some fat soluble nutrients like carotene. At this point, you've already done quite an extensive workup, but we do have some additional tests if you know it's still not able to be recommended at this point. And at this point, you're gonna be looking more for those rarer diagnoses, those zebras that we talked about earlier, which are those neuroendocrine tumors. So these tests would be a VIP level, a somatostatin and 5-HIA level and calcitonin level as well as a gastrin level. All right, and that's essentially your approach to the evaluation of diarrhea. So again, focus on whether it is acute or chronic. If it's acute, you have a decision point to make on who to test and who not to test. And most of these patients are just gonna be a self-limited uh, illness without further testing being needed. And then for chronic, differentiate between what type of diarrhea they're having. The differential varies based on the history that you get from the patient. And then you have this first pass, second pass, and third pass workup as uh, demonstrated down here. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. I hope it was helpful for you. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.